What if a billion people regularly interfaced with these plants, with themselves, essentially? Yeah. Tapped into their own source of love, tapped into their own wisdom from the shrooms, from Aya, from DMT, whatever works for people. Mm -hmm. What would the world look like? And then the bigger vision that came to me was, what if a billion people took mushrooms on the same day, at the same time, worldwide, wow. with the intention of love? What would happen to the Earth's frequency? Wow. If a billion people were tuned into this energy. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Vitruvian Podcast, a podcast about self-mastery. I'm your host, Zach Shankin. Today, I'm joined by James. James is a cosmonaut of human consciousness, self-declared shroom wizard, and the host of The James Zander Trip, a podcast focused on consciousness, spirit, and mind through the lens of psychedelics. James is also a new friend and one of my first connections made here on the ground in Bali, so I'm excited for our conversation today. James, welcome to the show, brother. Thank you so much for having me, man. Yeah, I appreciate you taking, of course, the time, but on top of all that, like I said in the the intro there, you were my first, one of the first people I met mm -hmm. on the ground in Bali, and even before I took my heroic mission across the world, um, we were able to hop on a call ahead of time, mutual connection of Talon, shout out Talon if you're listening or watching. Um, he connected us, and then we got on a call, and I found that there was enough like-mindedness and, and open-mindedness as well, mm -hmm. that uh, I was curious to hear more about your world, share it with my audience, um, and just kind of share the space. And then once we had our first few conversations, it was pretty evident that a podcast would do really well. Thank you, man. Uh, yeah, it's an honor to be on your show. I've listened to a few episodes. Um, you're great. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, so typically the way I open things up is with an open-ended question, but I always like to hear how people found themselves to the world of self-mastery. Um, mm. You can call it self-development, self-actualization, but essentially a raising of consciousness, if you will, like the, the light bulb moment or maybe a gradual turning towards I am both capable and maybe meant for more. Mm. Um, was it a book, a moment, a psychedelic experience? Yeah. Um, how was that transition like? And yeah, open-ended. I wish it was a psychedelic experience. That would have been cool. Um, my first intro to personal growth was through a book. And it came about in a really interesting way. Um, I was at a bus stop waiting to go to school. And this random kid from a grade above me, out of the blue, just said, hey, do you know your thoughts create reality? I have no idea what prompted him to say this. And I think I was 13, 14 wow. at the time. I was like, no, I have, I have no clue. And he's like, go read Ask and It Is Given by Abraham Hicks. And I went to the library and I got the book. And at the very beginning of the book, there's a foreword by Wayne Dyer. And I think he says something like, this book will change your life. And at that young, impressionable age, you know, I really believed it. I was like, wow. And, and I read this book um, and it introduced me to Law of Attraction, the way that our thoughts have power, and led me down to probably led me to The Secret later on, James Allen, um, Science of Getting Rich by Wallace Waddles, all these great books and all these great teachers. And it all started with Abraham Hicks and the random guy that I was not friends with. I didn't know him. He just randomly, for some reason, thought to recommend the book. And I think maybe it's, I, I, I was thinking of that, of like, is it a divine plan that mm. there are certain pieces of knowledge that are given to you at the right moment mm. to accelerate your evolution that you don't come into life completely a blank slate mm. or if you do there's people and resources and books that are almost designed like little video game cheat codes to at the right moment come into your life and just nudge you a little bit and then of course we have free will so we can choose to decline the nudge or go into it fortunately i went full into it and and that was the journey that began okay. there it's amazing. And, you know, I think we've talked about before, and I've certainly mentioned on this podcast, but like coincidence is a word that I think we should all remove from our vocabulary. Like yeah. it is all happening for a reason. And one of the quotes that I really like from the Kabbalion is that the lips of wisdom are sealed except to the ears of understanding. Mm. Similarly, mm. the master will appear when the student is ready. And so it's, it's those moments, like for instance, that moment for you. Yeah could have only been facilitated 
if you were ready to receive it, right? That that open mindedness, like as a 13 year old, without a wall of limiting beliefs or some other school competing school of thought. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was, like you said, kind of a catalyst or like a switching point to begin this other, I guess, like leg or fractal of your experience. Um, And yeah, for anyone who's looking for a killer reading list, the books you listed right there are not a bad place to start. Yeah, I think everyone should read James Allen, As a Man Thinketh. It's a very short book. I think it's phenomenal. And um, every person on earth should read it, honestly. In 50 pages, it describes basically how your consciousness creates reality. Yeah, it is really profound. And I almost find that books like that or books like The Four Agreements that are just so concise yet so profound, it's almost too concise Mm. where you can get through it in a sitting and you're like, yeah, 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 I get it. Your your thoughts create your reality. But like sitting in that truth and then embodying it in your life is a completely different experience. And I completely agree. Like, mandatory reading for anyone on this podcast like you can find the pdf online it's like a 50 page essentially an essay it's totally free Um, anyone can read it right and if this is the moment for you that you first are exposed to that kind of concept um take it in as much as you are capable or aware of and then see what kind of fruits begin to appear in your life in those little kind of sprinkled ways whether it be someone that comes into your life or you pick up on a specific note from a TV show or Mm -hmm. a podcast you're listening to later or a lecture that you're in in university, like it's, it's the, it's sowing the seeds essentially. And then the, the growth can happen under, underneath the, underneath the soil, um, only to reap its fruit later. Yeah. And one thing I would tell my younger self is, study the books but also study your life Mm. especially in areas of manifestation or how thoughts create reality the best teacher is your own life Mm. how have you manifested things so far what are the results you're actually getting because it's easy to read these books and be inspired um but not get results like there's probably thousands of people who have read ask and is given or as a man thinketh and they're still thinking or they're still asking and they've not been given and the, the key, I think, is to look at your life and understand the symbols. What is your life trying to tell you? Mm. I think that is huge um, and a practice that I'm extremely bullish on. And it is like a nature of a lot of the work in my program is like prompted, whether it's journaling or even just spending time with yourself, but like reflective work. You have to look mm-hmm. back at the past because that is the only thing that is like fixed in time as some sort of concrete version of history that can be analyzed. It's a good data set. It's a great data set. It's your your best data set. And on top of it, you're emotionally connected to it. So yeah. you can feel into those moments. And that is the second thing that I think stands out is that as a man thinketh, like the only thing that is missing or misleading about that title is that it really isn't the conscious mind uh-huh. and the thoughts that are that we uh, intentionally think. Like you can go down and sit and read the affirmation. I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to be, but you can't, you have to feel what being a millionaire feels mm-hmm, like. Mm-hmm. You have to project yourself into that moment, yeah. experience the emotion of abundance with your eyes closed, and it will ultimately become your reality because you are kind of, I'm reading reality transurping right now. So the, Oof, the metaphor comes to mind. So good. So good. Very powerful and also extremely dense. So I'm kind of taking it one chapter at a time. I have time. not read the whole book. I'm still going through okay, it. Yeah. It's like 700 pages. Yeah. I, it's. I had no idea it was going to be more of a textbook than a like reading book. But I had a friend, Spencer, a previous episode of this podcast, we talked about it. And he's like, oh, you haven't read it. I'll gift it to you. So thank you, Spencer. And I needed a book long enough for like a month plus journey here. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm glad I picked that one. But Definitely like a three or four kilo load in the the suitcase. Yes, I recommend the Kindle, (laughs) the Kindle version. It's an incredible book. And it actually speaks to what you said that you, uh, you need to hear. How did you say the the lips of wisdom are sealed? uh, The the lips of wisdom are sealed except to the ears of understanding. So I picked up Reality Transurfing years ago. And I did find it to be a cool book, but I didn't connect with it as deeply Mm. as when I came back to it now. And now with life experience and seeing how my own manifestations come around, oof, I understand it on such a deeper level. Yeah. And now I'm diving in. I'm like eating it up. It's just so freaking good because I can relate to it and I can understand it. Whereas my younger self maybe 
it was too abstract or maybe too dense at the time. Yeah. And I, I even, you know, there's been a number of, it's like obviously a very physically large book. It also has like a very vibrant color. So a lot of people when I'm reading it are like, oh, what are you reading? Mm -hmm. And I kind of just laugh and hand it to them because it's yeah. very, first of all, hard to describe, but second of all, <laughs> so it, unique. It, it's, it's very unique. It has to be kind of taken as a grain of salt. And they're like, oh, do you recommend it? And I, it's more of like, where are you at in your life yeah. before you can arrive to it? Like you can't just cold give that to a 16 year old kid who's never read any of the content we're kind of relatively speaking about, in my opinion, it would just be kind of overwhelming. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that, like you said, it's who you are when you arrive to the book mm -hmm. and where you are in your life. And it's why I'm now at a season of my life where I'm being intentional about, there's a number of books that are now in reread rotation, whether uh -huh. it's four times a year, twice a year, whatever. What are those for you? Um, well, two that stand out to me is The Four Agreements. I read that once a quarter because yeah. it is so small, but it is so profound. And it can be one of those things that you just forget. Life gets hectic. You get trapped in your emotions. You get trapped in the day-to-day. -day, you get trapped in your goals. Um, and grounding yourself in those four agreements, I think, has personally been extremely profound. I even have them in my morning affirmations as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second is How to Win Friends and Influence People by mm -hmm. Dale Carnegie. It's one of those books that, like, when you read it, again, it, it is, it's like almost brain dead obvious, and yet no one is doing it, including yourself, like when you get trapped in your own world. And the reason it works, or any of the concepts in that book work, are because we are so self-centric creatures. And so if you can consistently take yourself out and put other people in the limelight, um, it can give you a tremendous amount of empathy and influence if that's what you're looking for um and it just makes you it it, it kind of consciously re sends you back towards a place of empathy as opposed to self-centeredness which is our kind of carnal inclination i would suppose we need those reminders and rereading a book is the best thing you can do if, if something resonates with you my God, we forget so much mm. of what we read or what we listen to. There are certain podcasts, certain audios, uh, certain videos on YouTube that I just come back to and come back to because you want to instill it. You want to make it part of your essence, part of your being. Mm. Um, you remind me of a story by uh, Bob Proctor. Mm. One of his favorite books was uh, Think and Grow Rich. And he would read it every single day for 30 years uh, or maybe even longer. But it was a tattered book by the end. Like it was yeah. the same copy. And every day he would read it, maybe 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Mm. Imagine instilling a book that you read every single day for 30 years, how much of that will infuse your soul mm. and teach you those lessons over and over and over again. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's powerful. And again, not a bad choice as one that you would put in the daily rotation. Um, mm. Think and Grow Rich is extremely, extremely powerful and I really don't think it it matters all too much what that book is for the proverbial you, like whoever's listening. And it really is what resonates with you deeply, what you find gives you room to grow and kind of explore and still continue to find new things. Like for instance, I'm this year rereading or, or reading for the first time to completion the Bible, uh -huh. even though I was raised Christian um, and I read plenty of the Bible through school because I was raised in Christian education. So it was like, you have to memorize this chapter, memorize this first. Do, uh, I took a Bible class most of elementary through senior year of high school. Um, Back then, did it resonate? Uh, certain parts, definitely. But it's, uh, it's kind of what we're talking about. Like the man will never meet the river the same because he's different and the river mm -hmm. has changed. And the book reading is literally exactly the same. Like I am so, so different than I was then. And the book is going to speak to me or stand out to me differently every time I read it. And my inclination for that specifically was that like, it seems to be maybe the most significant written, written text that we have in modernity um, or that has survived in modernity. So as someone who likes to read, I felt like I would be, I felt like I would be remiss if I, if I didn't have that at least one time through. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm not, I'm reading it with the open intention to just see what comes out to me. I'm not looking to become a theologian. I'm not looking to dive back into this Christian faith specifically, but with an open-minded perspective and now having read in many other schools of philosophy and religion and being not tied 
to the dogma of the religion mm-hmm. and looking to because my my I was talking about this actually yesterday with a friend. My upbringing, I clung tremendously to my intellect to like ward off my insecurities. Um, it was something that I was naturally more predisposed to, and so especially through Christian education, I identified with God and the Bible solely on an intellectual level. Like I loved apologetics, which is defense of the faith. So I would, I, I was just, I would take those classes and I'd be like, okay, what verse can I say to somebody who's an atheist that can prove this and that? And like, so I was really obsessed with like kind of the debate aspect, fully an intellectual pursuit. But um, you kind of said something like, there's a difference between reading and knowing in your life mm-hmm. for manifestation. Mm-hmm. And very, very similarly, I find for me personally, I used to know God, like I could send you verses and give you the X's and O's and tell you all the stats. But now I feel like I have experienced God and felt it. And it's such, so juxtaposed, Mm -hmm. you know, because apologetics is so un-Christ-like. Like Like I can't picture Christ stepping into a debate hall and just like systematically piecing someone up. It's, he, he, for all intents and purposes, he was a yogi. He was just the embodiment of love, presence. Um, and making people feel seen and heard, whether it was prostitutes, beggars, lepers, the disaffected, the money changers. Um, and I think that even if we just take the metaphorical life of Christ, there is so much to take from that as a way of life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm curious. So 13 is the 13 or 14, 13 or 14 is the seeds are sown. So that's, beginning of high school ish age uh Uh, junior high end of junior high yeah so very very young lots of story left between the two what did it begin to open up for you and what did that path look like out of high school into university and after Mm -hmm. um what it opened up for me was a burning curiosity about the nature of reality Mm. and that has stayed with me for for years and years um to understand like what is this reality okay if thoughts create reality how is that possible what is are we in a simulation are we in a field of energy and i think i always felt like there must be more to reality than meets the eye and i kept searching for proof Mm. um and i think this is kind of skipping ahead but where psychedelics were really important for me is that i finally found my proof Because on psychedelics, you start seeing energy. Mm. You start seeing frequency. It's like someone turns the dial of your perception to 100. And suddenly, the sober reality becomes something more. And you you see into the the matrix. I don't know. You see into the pixels of reality. Mm. You realize, wow, this is something deeper. There's something deeper going on here. Um, But until psychedelics, I'd always wanted like a UFO experience or like an out-of-body experience, something to tell me that there was more to reality mm. than just the tangible. So, And that, that entire time, was it more of a, an internal gnosis or intuition that something else is going on here? There can't just be the, the physical? I think it was internal. It was also the books were affecting me. You know, mm. what you read becomes part of you. So I believed the books, and yet there was this little bit of doubt of like, okay, maybe they're just trying to sell me something. Um, which some books probably are, Mm. but I still, I felt this gnosis inside. I'm like, I think it makes sense what they're saying about thoughts and how the mind creates and how perhaps this is all a projection of your consciousness. It all made sense on some deeper level, but the psychedelics was where it really, really, uh, opened up for me in that sense. So let's go into that first experience. Yeah. How did that come about? And yeah, just walk me through that a little bit. It was it was beautiful. The first experience was LSD. And my friend and I went camping in nature. And he brought two tabs. We had both never done it, but we're both curious to try it. We were so naive, we thought um, we drank a bit of coffee in the morning. And then I freaked out because I was like, wait, are we allowed to mix caffeine with acid? And you are, <laughs> for the record. <laughs> but I didn't know. And it was kind of funny. And um, that trip was magical because it shifted my consciousness. So for those 10 to 12 hours that you're an acid, you are still you. Mm -hmm. I'm still James. 
And yet I'm perceiving myself outside of the box, the ego that is James. Mm. I'm perceiving myself almost like a zoomed out perspective. And I think that was the first time that I really felt that. And it was so freaking cool. I was like, wow, I didn't know you could just switch into a different frequency and you're still here. You're not seeing dragons. You're not seeing some, you know, sometimes the cartoons around psychedelics, they, sure. they make it seem like Alice in Wonderland. Mm -hmm. it, it can be in some aspects, but for like a regular dose, you're still here, but you're seeing something much more, much deeper. Mm. Um, we were nature. So that was really beneficial because mm -hmm. that connection with nature, being able to see the rustling of the leaves, the frequency of the trees. Mm. I remember looking at um, a reflection of myself in like a puddle and I could literally deconstruct my ego and see all the layers of my ego in that puddle mm. of like, wow, I'm wearing so many layers. And that's one of the other benefits of, of psychedelics is they remove that ego part of you mm. and the authentic self starts to come out. And then you get out of the trip and you put the layers back on. Sure. But the more often you do it and you go back to that world, you start leaving some layers off and start trusting reality mm -hmm. to be able to be seen, you know, as you. So that experience was the beginning of many things. Because from acid, I then tried shrooms, then tried DMT. Mm -hmm. um, DMT was a pivotal moment as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I love what you said about like the this being around nature and then seeing that connectedness. Mm -hmm. um, it's Dr. Zach Bush. I'm not sure if you're familiar, but he's been on the Joe Rogan podcast amongst others. And he's kind of a pretty important figure, in my opinion, in the kind of holistic medicine space. And has talked about kind of curing cancer without traditional all allopathic methods um, and has been thwarted by big pharma in some of his efforts. So really mm -hmm. interesting character, but something he said, um, one of the most kind of profound sound bites that I took from him was like humanity's biggest mistake or crime was thinking that it was somehow separate from nature. Mm -hmm. Like it is man and then nature as if we are not a connected part. Um, and it's cool to hear as someone who is, again, I think what's cool about this conversation is I have never taken any of sort of these substances. So I have not that, yet, not yet. Certainly. <laughs> I have not heard the call. Um, but I get to play kind of the innocent child mind um, for those that in the audience are also curious about the space, but also haven't had their first experience. So it's cool to hear that you saw that connectedness and yeah. not just from a conceptual level, like, yes, we are part of nature, woo, but I am actually part of nature mm -hmm. and like that, the warmth. And I'm curious in that first uh, LSD experience, was it, was it an emotional was there an emotionality to what you were going through? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. There was many moments of, of emotion. Um, that's the beauty of it too, is it's not just mental. You really mm -hmm. feel it. There's a funny moment that happened in the trip where um, it had been raining and there was a bunch of slugs on the ground crawling across the floor. And I just crouched down and I looked at this slug and I was staring at it for like 15 minutes, just connecting with the slug. <laughs> and the thought that was going through my mind was, what it's doing is the most important thing in the world to it, <laughs> right? Oh, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. it is the most, it's doing the most important thing it can possibly do in its little life. Mm -hmm. And having that, like a true empathy and a true connection, like this is not just uh, an insect, this is like another conscious being living out its purpose. And it was like unbelievable. You know, when I describe it, I'm describing it mentally because it happened years ago. Right. But in that moment of like okay. truly connecting with a slug. Right. Like imagine that. Yeah. Um, it changes you. Definitely. I mean, it's, I like that it is sort of a playful example. Um, yeah. And I'm I, to play devil's advocate, I'm sure it sounds pretty, <laughs> pretty out there to anyone who's like, yeah, okay, buddy. Uh, but I do think that, yeah, it is like all of reality is fractal in nature meaning like a singular part is a is a version of the larger whole um and yeah like that that's very emblematic of even our own lives where life capital l maybe is happening constantly mm -hmm. but our life is our entire world 
Yeah. And then when you're walking down the street, every single one of those other people that you see, like they're wrapped up in an insanely complex reality that is just them. Um, And completely different from yours. Right. This is so fascinating. We think we live in a shared reality, but really we live in our mind. So there's 8 billion different minds, 8 billion different softwares running in the brain, completely seeing reality differently, agreeing on some things, but mostly having a completely unique experience. Yeah, I'm interested in your take on that with even what we're talking about as like reality is only experienced in our mind and perception and Mm. potentially is a projection of our individual consciousness. Do you think that there, in a very real metaphysical sense, is other people? Wow, deep question. Right, because like we'll take this this podcast studio to like break the fourth wall. You are the only person that exists for me right now. For Mm -hmm. all intents and purposes, the boundary conditions are this room Mm -hmm. and you and me. Um, So you are some sort of mirror for me and my mind is perceiving everything. What's behind me isn't there unless I look at it. Yeah. And I'm looking right at you. So do you think that there are other people actually? (laughs) And that's pretty out there. I know this got metaphysical pretty quick. I love this. Um, my friend Steve likes to ask, how many consciousnesses can you perceive? Mm. And the answer is always one. Mm. You can only perceive your own consciousness. So that kind of that's interesting. Why are we not able to perceive other people's consciousness? We can see them. We can mm. talk to them. But we have no proof that they're actually a separate consciousness. So the way I like to th- see it is, it's not that other people don't exist, but... I guess zooming out, I think it's all one mind, one consciousness yeah. that is split up into all these different characters and avatars. And then somehow you're only able to perceive your own. It's like you're living in your own hologram and everything that is happening to you is a reflection of your mind. And yet other people, I think they, they do exist, but they're, they're also in their own hologram. And you mm-hmm. can only intersect your frequencies match Mm. it's like you came to bali completely different world yeah completely different frequency one could say that until you came here it didn't bali didn't exist for you yep all the people you've met here were not part of your consciousness you did not perceive them Mm. so very deep question i don't know if i'm no even qualified to answer that (laughs) well neither i'll say that flat out neither of us are qualified but i don't know that there's any organization that can give that certification yeah and i think you handled it really well um because i too believe in the collective consciousness idea um and that whether you call it god source infinite intelligence whatever the term is but it is you know we are spiritual beings having a physical experience Mm -hmm. and that limited what you're describing is like the limited field of consciousness perception mm-hmm. me or you or anyone it's it's limited through the physical vehicle and i was having this conversation same dude that i referred to earlier he uh we were talking about truth like can you ever in this life access or grasp onto capital t truth so like pure consciousness And I read something that I like that I'm going to, I told him and I'll tell you is I'm going to keep with me until I find a better phrase for it, but it's from reality transurfing. And it is that the truth is always somewhere nearby (laughs) because reality, one thing reality transurfing does well is he constantly reminds you that it's like, this is just a technology. This is a framework, Yes, but it is not the framework. And there's all these other tools technologies out there and you can call them technologies you can call them mental models frameworks whatever yeah for parsing through this crazy hard problem Mm -hmm. and it i like that phrase that the truth is always somewhere nearby because it gives you permission to not have to grab on or like dogmatically or religiously tie and say like this Mm -hmm. is exactly right Mm -hmm. instead you can say i hear what you're saying and it feels a lot similar to what i'm saying so somewhere between us, the truth is nearby yeah. and we can just be okay with that. Mm-hmm. And in this experience, limited by our physical reality, the meat suit, whatever thing, we can't fully grab it and we'll never be able to. So it's okay. I'm so glad you brought up reality transurfing <laughs> because in it, he says, this is one model of the universe. 
and it's designed to give you results, but it's not, it's a model. It's the finger pointing at the moon. It's not the moon itself, mm. you know? So I think sometimes going back to law of attraction, people treat law of attraction as this almost like a religion, like yep. it is a law. It's a model and it seems to get results for a lot of people. But the actual truth, we are only guessing at this, how this reality works. So I always say to people, just look at your results. If a model is giving you results, perfect, keep using it. But never forget that it's a model. Um, and, and psychedelics are the same way. It's another lens to look at reality. And I'm glad you brought up truth because I think part of the reason I'm so attracted to psychedelics is I feel like they're giving me more truth. Mm more truth about myself, yep. more truth about the nature of reality. I keep going deeper into myself and finding more. And it feels like on a deep soul level true. I'm like, okay, this is better than any book because I'm not reading it from a guru. I'm being, I'm channeling it. I'm downloading information from the cosmos or from my subconscious. You can just see it. Same, from, same. Same, same. Yeah. Super conscious, subconscious, you know, who right. knows? So, um, I think psychedelics are an incredible tool for looking at truth. But then I'm so glad you brought up, you know, the model part of like, just treat everything as a model. Yeah. And I do want to caveat because part of this is my, my Christian upbringing, but it, it doesn't mean for anyone listening that there isn't an objective truth and we can all just descend into true relativism where like up is down, down is up, like just kind of chaotic non-reality. Because I think even from just a societal level, it's very problematic, right? Well, that like, wouldn't give you results. Exactly. If it was up is down, down is up, there's no more sense. You're, it, it's, it's a model that wouldn't work. Yeah, yeah. extremely ineffective, especially ineffective. at like a, a group, <laughs> a group uh, scale. And we've seen it time and time again. We're kind of seeing it specifically in America where like, oh yeah, just we're kind of flipping words on their heads and yes. everything is not as it maybe is, should be, or previously was. Uh, and we're seeing the results as you say we can look at the stat sheet and say well maybe this model mm -hmm. isn't as effective as where we came from um someone described it as a distortion mm. you know we're really good at creating distortions like you said flipping words and and i'm and if you look at the results of that and say well what makes more sense going back to that mm. going back to the truth yeah and the the truth thing is is really powerful and and experiencing it like you said the downloads, I actually also between the last time we talked, and I'm glad that it did. Obviously, I don't believe it happened for coincidence, but it can really inform this conversation. Mm. So I had told you that I've not, I've chosen not to take any sort of psychedelic journeys because I want to, and this is just my personal frame, is I want to maximize my endogenous experience. And then whenever that time does open up where, okay, I am curious to, or I feel called to go on a plant medicine journey, I will. Um, so I did have my first guided breathwork session. It was like a two hour breathwork. I've done uh, like Wim Hof and stuff, kind of like energetic breathing, um, just through guided YouTube videos on my own time. But I've never, I've never gone as deep as I did in this experience because it was facilitated because it was in a very sacred and safe space. And it was also deep. It was like a two hour. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I now have experienced what I had not before, but like you're describing that observer role of observing yourself, seeing yourself, but not leaving yourself. Like yeah. I was still very much on the floor breathing, but in a way I could see myself doing it as well. Um, Zach 2.0. Yeah. Something like that. Um, a fractal version or kind of a, extrapolated version but the the emotionality that came through the empathy for myself mm -hmm. um i i'll probably i i will do a podcast specifically on that experience to kind of go into those um specific downloads that i got because i want to give it its due time but um it was remarkable mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. absolutely profound the things that i felt about myself about my younger self even about the people that I went with. I don't know that if you've met Cody or Lindsay, but they're two guys that I've met here um, in Bali and they've kind of welcomed me into their little like family here on the ground. And so they've become quick friends, but you know, it's, it had only been like two and a half weeks. And then in a matter of two hours, we're all coming out of the experience and starting to integrate and, you know, we're holding each other in each other's arms crying. Mm -hmm. And yeah. what was crazy is I actually felt the collective consciousness. Cause I saw 
Cody specifically in my experience. And mm-hmm. I actually was like called to like hug him when we came out. And I told him, I was like, one of the things that I got was I have to hug you right now. Mm-hmm. And so it was just crazy because finally what used to be just completely conceptual, like the idea of the mastermind from Napoleon Hill, the idea of collective consciousness, the idea that we are sharing a space and, and something between us is linked beyond just the audio we're sending back and forth. I got to feel it. And that is like so amplified, like the emotional power of the heart space versus just the head space. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I just thought I'd kind of throw that in there and say that I, I've, I've kind of started to taste it and it's, it's really incredible. My first breathwork experience was also r- remarkable, extraordinary. I, I went into it. It was a guided um, YouTube video that someone sent me. Nice. Uh, it was 90 minutes, maybe two hours. Wow. And I had no expectations. In fact, I ignored that video for months. Yeah, I was yeah. like, okay, my friend sent it to me. I'll, I'll check it out later. And then one day I was having a really tough day. I was like, nothing's working. Okay, let me try this tool that my friend sent me. Went into it with no expectations, which is actually great because you you don't think anything's going to happen. And I'm doing the work and I'm (laughs) breathing and (laughs) breathing out and nothing's happening. Like not really. And then like 70% of the way in there, it just kicks. Mm. And it feels like a, almost like a mini DMT trip. Okay. Yeah. I was like, wow this is incredible just from breath Mm. yeah yeah i was i was actually going to ask because now with science now that science is caught up we now know that we have parts of our body that can produce endogenous dmt the Mm -hmm. pineal gland specifically Mm -hmm. so i did now that you have knowing that you have had both an exogenous experience and the breath work Mm -hmm. endogenously how do those two compare as far as i'll I'll just let that be kind of open-ended for me, the exogenous is still far stronger mm-hmm. and far deeper. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe if I was doing breath work every day and really made it a practice, mm-hmm. there's probably people on this planet who can get to that pure DMT realm mm-hmm. simply through breath. Um, but for me, I do find it helpful to to take it. Sure. Um, and I think it, it's it's funny, like all roads lead to Rome. After I did DMT, when I started doing shrooms and I would do a very deep shroom trip, it was like, imagine a map and I was reaching the terrain of DMT. It's like shrooms, shrooms, shrooms. Oh, we're reaching the DMT playground here. Mm. Not fully because the DMT will take you faster and quicker there. Mm. But just the edge. I'm like, wow. So all of these substances potentially at a high enough dose end up leading to that source that dmt state interesting and that was fascinating for me that is fascinating because to my very novice understanding each of the substances will we've described like lsd Mm -hmm. mushrooms and dmt have different effects they do on the brain and also a different either visual or euphoria kind of breakdown is that true it's true i think there's parallels though Okay. Especially between shrooms and DMT, mm-hmm. I truly find at a at a at a high enough level of psilocybin, you start entering the DMT realm. Interesting. Yeah. And when you say high uh, DMT realm, does mm-hmm. it become the visuals that are becoming comparative, or almost just that f- feeling of connection to consciousness, or maybe both? When I'm doing shrooms, it's it's the visuals. The mm-hmm. visuals become very dmt like is okay. the only way i can put it there's yeah. a certain aesthetic to them that screams dmt <laughs> it's like the geometry and the geometry people sometimes describe it as legoland like almost like everything is made of these little lego pieces yeah um yeah when i did a very deep dmt trip that's where you break through so a breakthrough is considered it's like you fully leave this reality mm-hmm. and you're still on the bed you know breathing and everything's fine um but your consciousness is in a totally different realm. Mm -hmm. So I haven't gone there with shrooms in that way, Okay, which is why I say DMT still feels like the ultimate gateway to really go deep. Yeah. Um, And ayahuasca as well, because ayahuasca, the main ingredient in ayahuasca is DMT. Interesting. So it'll take you there as well. Um, One thought that immediately comes to mind is how does, is there a risk with DMT of like complete disassociation 
I personally don't think so. Okay. If you're of sound mind. Interesting. Characterize that for me. Like for me, I know myself. Yeah. I know that, um, I also know from DMT, you always come back. Like it's this, even though it feels like you're there forever and time loses all meaning and mm -hmm. you, you're in this different world. I just know, well, physically a DMT trip is 10 to 20 minutes max. Like wow. the body cannot, um, store the stay in that state. It's going to work through the DMT. It's going to chew through it really fast. <laughs> so you're going to end up back in your body and yourself pretty quick. Okay. Um, so I think that just grounds me. I'm like, I know it's, it's going to, same thing happened on shrooms. Once I took a huge, hero, I didn't even, hero dose. hero dose, I was very arrogant, didn't even measure it. I was just feeling like I wanted to do a strong dose. Don't recommend that. I always recommend measuring your dose. Um, and I just lost myself in this shroom trip to the point where I was like, how am I going to explain to my parents that I've like, that I've completely changed. And these thoughts were happening in it? In the trip. Like okay. I was on my, lying on my bed and like, I just felt like I had gone so far. I'm like, when I go home for Christmas, they're going to notice like <laughs> something is very different with me. And then like a few minutes later, something kicked in me and was like, oh, it's just a trip. Okay. This is going to be over in six hours. Interesting. And indeed in six hours, it was, I was back to, to myself. Um, so to answer your question, I think probably there's cases where people have been lost, but for the majority of people, I think it's safe mm -hmm. in the right environment with a trip sitter, if possible, sure. with the right intention. This is super important. If you go into it with the intention of love, the intention of learning, the intention of I am a student of the universe and I respect this medicine and I'm not here to fuck around or to play around. I'm here to learn. It will treat you with respect mm. and it'll, it'll not most likely it will not send you to some dark corner of the universe where you're going to suffer for eons and then throw you back out. Yeah. But people, you know, sometimes they abuse the medicine or they they are like, Oh, fuck it. Let's do it. Right. That's where you're getting into dangerous territory. Yeah, I agree. Um, the power of the intention is so powerful because it returns to all of the answers are within you. Everything is a projection of your consciousness. And if you come in with those lower vibrational thoughts of fear, anger, insecurity, envy, greed, uh, rage, hatred, or even just like selfish kind of hedonistic, like I just want to get high kind of thing. I think you're right. That's where things can slip and whether it's a kind of neurological break and we want to like analyze it with science or if it's more of like a spiritual dissolution of self it is concerning and i think yeah that was another thing with my breath work is that like they asked us to set an intention beforehand mm. and because i hadn't had anything before and because i knew myself my intention was to just stay open because i i everything in my life is curated like exactly how I want it. I'm a master of my, my reality, um, which means I like and enjoy control. Like I, uh -huh. I, I'm not somebody, I think I've become better about being like controlling over like other people and, and environments like that. But I do like to have routines, regiments, eat what I want, do what I want, like at all times. And that's, that has led me to the place that I am. However, knowing that when I'm taken a bit outside of the the boundaries, I know it can be I could want to grab it and pull it back in. So I knew that potentially I was going to be wading into waters that would make me uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So I set the intention of just openness. They gave us like different oils to access the different chakras. And so I chose the heart just mm -hmm. to keep that heart space open, knowing how much my entire life I've lived in my head, cerebrally, consciously, and wanting to access more of the subconscious, more of the heart, more of the, the infinite. Yeah. Um, and it gave you that. And it gave me exactly that, which was crazy. Yeah. Um, it's very receptive to intention, the universe in general. It's remarkable. It's remarkable when you, when you just from the sow heart. that seed, mm -hmm. just sow that seed. And, and I actually feel it, like really, really feel it. Mm -hmm. It was remarkable because it was reflected, you know, in a two hours, in sh a two, short two hours, I could say, okay, exactly what I set before as an intention was manifest and brought to me which was really cool because I think that's one of the tightest feedback loops you could get maybe other than a DMT trip, you know, 15, 20 minute turnaround. So yeah, it's really, really cool to hear that and always circle back to 
the power is within you. Like yeah. you are still the all powerful, the creator of your reality. And being open, I love how you said open minded, um, being open to the magic of life. Mm -hmm. When you control everything, you need to leave a little bit of space, potentially a lot of space, for some something new, something un, 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 unexplainable, mysterious. So one of the intentions for anyone doing a psychedelic trip or breath work could be, show me something I haven't seen before. Mm. Surprise me. Delight me. Yeah. Because you're you've mentioned uh that you felt like you might be wading into uncomfortable or unfamiliar waters. But you could approach that with excitement as well. Ooh. I'm gonna see I'm wading new. into the map, the terrain that I've not yet explored. Yeah. Okay, universe, keep me safe and surprise me. Yeah, and going, I guess, very full circle back to the manifestation space, I have actually changed my approach with goal setting because of a different frame where instead of setting and we i want to talk this leads into your your big goal with what you're working on but i do believe in setting kind of extremely audacious goals but i love playing with the idea and i talked about it on a podcast i went on recently the tyro experience with my friend nolan mm -hmm. he I, I was kind of going into this idea of what if it could happen better than you can imagine yes like setting that goal maybe maybe you're a business person we'll, we'll keep it x's and o's to make it um clear you set a goal of a hundred million dollars by setting that goal you've created your ceiling and not the floor that you're hoping to rise to but what if you could make 500 million or 5 billion you have no idea how high it could go or surprise you or the connection that you make or a merger and acquisition. And that's just the business vertical. Life at large can be taken by the exact same extent. If you're too explicit with the ideal partner you want for yourself, you know exactly what she may look like, height, weight, hair color, eye color, background, interests, hobbies, blah, blah, blah. Like if you're too granular, you'll never meet the person who blows that character completely out of the water mm -hmm. that you didn't even know could exist. Mm -hmm. she, she's more beautiful and more present with you and more attractive and more intriguing uh, and empathetic than you could ever, ever imagine. Yes. So I, I love now with goals setting almost just the direction, mm -hmm. but letting the universe determine the magnitude. Yeah, I love that. And that's why like authors like Neville Goddard, one of my favorite authors, he talks about feeling is a secret. So just feel, let's say you want a partner, you feel the love, you feel exactly the feeling you want to feel, but you leave the details up to the universe and it'll probably deliver to you something better than what you could have imagined. Um, but on the flip side, I do see there's, there's a lot of people are not specific enough Yep, and they're very vague. I want money. How much money? Right. What does that mean to you? You know? And so um, I think it's, it's helpful to have a target. Yeah. Um, I think it was Bob Proctor who said, targets are good for the soul. <laughs> I always love that quote. Nice. Targets are good because you're combining it, this like mental thing with like a spiritual thing. Yeah. But it's like, targets are good for the soul. Give, give the mind something to work towards. Mm. And also you could add to that intention or something better. Yeah. I want a billion dollars. Or more. <laughs> or something even better. Sure. You know? Yeah, yeah, I like that a lot. And I guess going into goal setting specifically for yourself, mm -hmm. obviously the experiences that you have had with psychedelics has brought you into a space where you're now sharing more about your personal story, more about others who have had similar experiences. You work in and around the space, as I kind of alluded to in the intro. Uh, you have your own podcast about it. But one of the bigger goals that you have is that you want to hopefully over the lifetime of your business um, the project itself, bring a billion people to, th to, through, or into the space of psychedelics. So yes. talk, talk a little bit about how that idea even came to you. Yeah. Um, and what do you imagine that looking like? The idea came to me on ayahuasca. The mm -hmm. first ever ayahuasca ceremony I had. Um, first half of it, I experienced so much grief. Um, partly because of my own like stuff. Sure. But then it also became more worldwide. Because at the time, there was so much division in the world, around the state of the world. People had different opinions around um, you know what. Mm. <laughs> and, and I was like, how did we get here? Like, we're all one big family. We should all be united. And yet there's so much division. And I, 
asked Mother Aya in the ceremony, mentally asked her, what can we do to unite the planet? Books don't work unless you're ready for them. Gurus don't work. Politicians definitely don't work. Um, one leader is not going to magically unite the world. In fact, it'll probably divide the world even mm -hmm. more. And the answer I got, well, what worked for you? What brought you into deeper unity and alignment with yourself? Oh, plant medicine. So on plant medicine, there is no guru. It's you and you. And so the idea became, what if a billion people, first of all, what if a billion people were educated about psychedelics? Because so much misinformation about how bad they are is sure. being spread, and that's not true. But then what if a billion people regularly interfaced with these plants, with themselves, essentially, yeah. tapped into their own source of love, tapped into their own wisdom from the shrooms, from Aya, from DMT, whatever works for people. Mm -hmm. What would the world look like? And then the bigger vision that came to me was, what if a billion people took mushrooms on the same day, at the same time, worldwide, wow. with the intention of love? What would happen to the Earth's frequency? Wow. If a billion people were tuned into this energy, and like imagine with breathwork, if a billion people all did a breathwork ceremony that was two hours long in the right environment, yeah. all around the world, roughly around the same time, if possible, what would happen? Like, I, I think something incredible would happen. Yeah. I mean, it would, it, it, it almost calls to mind like, simulation tearing kind of implications right yeah. like something we that, would break the simulation yeah, would it break the simulation <laughs> would it simply like put the earth off of its kilter if we assume it's spherical and spinning through space yeah. um yeah i mean it's extremely profound and i like when when i found out that that was something that you were working on i was immediately attracted to it not even because i have a particular passion about psychedelics obviously completely have not experienced it myself but just the the audacity to put it into the universe. And I mean audacity mm -hmm. in the most complimentary way. Like mm -hmm. I, as a single person, James, have this really, really big idea mm -hmm. that could potentially put a dent in human history and I'm going to aim for it. The like, audacity came from being on the ayahuasca trip. Yeah. My mental mind would not have dared to assume that, I think. But because I was in the ceremony, fully tuned in, plugged in, turned on into my higher self. Mm -hmm. When the message came through, I received it. And I was like, yes, let's go. Let's do this. And, and because it came from ayahuasca, it, it feels like bigger than myself. Mm. It's like I was given yep. a mission to execute. Yeah, I described that with like the work that I'm doing. And again, not psychedelic necessarily induced. Um, and not even like meditation or, or direct moment of download. But... I look at what I'm working on now and like the names and the content and the, just all of it. And I'm like, you know, I could easily claim because nobody else did the work to make what I'm building with the Vitruvian, but I, I would feel extremely arrogant to claim it as my own. You mm -hmm. know, I feel like I was given this platform, given this idea, given the tools, given the assets, mm -hmm. it would be to, to spit in the face of God or whoever gave me all these kind of tools to not try to exercise it to the maximum capacity. And what's amazing is it's predominantly others focused. Mm -hmm. So it gives me a tremendous sense of fulfillment. And I know that I'm doing good. Obviously, the closer of this podcast for those that listen, and, and as you can see here in the room, like tattooed on my wrist is memento mori. Like, remember that you will die. Remember mm -hmm. that you are mortal. Remember that your time is not infinite, nor is it even guaranteed. So I always try to return to the place like if today was my last day, mm. if I lay my head down and don't wake up, am I happy with how today went and then life up until that point? And once I stepped into this slipstream of reality, this version mm -hmm. of myself, that answer immediately was yes. It was yes day after day after day after day. And it doesn't mean every day is perfect. It doesn't mean that I'm a perfect person. I still ha deal with greed, envy, lust, and you know malice towards others, all these things. But on a broad scale, like I have created a body of work that can live as long as they keep the internet on. Yeah. I have talked to and impacted thousands and thousands of people, which will eventually pro proliferate into hundreds of thousands or millions of people. But even if it was just one of those people, 
even if it was just this conversation, mm -hmm. right? Like something I said today, some mental model, a quote, a reminder of a book that you read that you need to revisit, like who knows what it could or would be. Yeah. But like, if that was it that needed to go and proliferate and then you go and succeed in your mission of bringing a billion people into plant medicine and into consciousness, then like, I'm cool with that. Like that, that makes my day a check mark. That makes my life a check mark. And it's why I'm so passionate about helping people find their thing because what I'm describing, like being on my mission is like a drug. I wake mm -hmm. up like fired up every single day. Like how is today going to turn out? What can I do today? Who am I going to talk to? How many more people can I connect with, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, I'm not that special. I just happened to stumble into mine, relatively speaking, at a young age. So as soon as I found it, I was like, well, this is amazing. Do you want some? Do you want some? And so creating the platform to uh, share it with as many people as possible. And I think that that childlike excitement that like I'm kind of exuberating is exactly what you're describing with the plant medicine, right? Mm -hmm. Like you found it. It is literally a drug, but you were like, <laughs> this is something that is so amazing and profound. Like I must share it. I must share it. Yeah. And that's amazing because it, 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 it is like the clearest confirmation that it is, that it is good and pure intention. Yeah. Because the second you experienced it, instead of give me more, mm. it was let me share. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like how amazing is that? Like other drugs like alcohol and money or, you know, cocaine or all these other kind of substances that can be very addictive in our world. A lot of that is that feels good. Let me get more. Yeah. And I think that those types of things, even sex, even whatever, we can say that. Maybe that there's a risk factor here. Maybe that is something that I should push away from. But the things that immediately become a gift to others, love, communion, laughter, smiles, uh, sharing yeah. space, listening, it's like that's that's the shit right there. It's also passing on the torch. You know, mm -hmm. if it not had been for other people, right. I might not have discovered psychedelics till much, much later or perhaps never. Um, so it's thanks to other people saying, hey, there's this interesting thing here. Do you want to try it? And then, of course, the open-mindedness to try it. Um, I love what you said. You know, as you were talking, I was thinking it's the ripples we create, mm. you know. So with your mission, you're creating these ripples. And those ripples will impact other people. And then those people will impact other people. And that's, that is the sweetest thing of life. When you have impacted someone's life in even the most minor but beneficial way, that reverberates for eternity. I completely agree. And I was playing with the idea or wrestling with the idea for a while um, with like legacy. It's mm. very, very long time. I was like, okay, I want to have a legacy. I want to, I want my grandsons, grandsons, grandsons to remember my name. Like I changed the arc of our family's trajectory. Maybe I became great. Um, who knows where directly all that comes from. But uh, I had kind of a paradigm shift when I heard her Alex Hermosi say like legacy is bullshit. Like he doesn't believe in mm. legacy because you know, one, one and a half, two generations down the line, like people will stop saying your name. Um, you know, people driving home from your funeral, for instance, are going to start thinking about their day and their insecurities and all that. And I think that is also a profound frame that can kind of free people to take big action because it's like, I don't have to worry too, too much. But I go back and forth on the importance of here because I think his route sometimes can dissolve into nihilism. Like there's no point. So there's no point. So let's just but is, see what happens. Is legacy just about people remember your name? To me, it's more about the impact that lasts long after people forget your name. Exactly. And I love something I saw ironically, or maybe not so ironically from Kanye. He was talking, I think it was on Lex Friedman's podcast, but he was saying that, that was a wild he one. wants to be, yeah, he wants to be forgotten. And Lex was kind of taken aback, especially given like our perception of Kanye, kind of the ego, et cetera. And he's like, do we know who made sidewalks? Do we know who made like the street lamp or these other things? And maybe we know who made the street lamp. But the point is, truly great pieces of art are transcendent. We benefit from them ad infinitum, but we don't need to know who because it wasn't even, that artist wouldn't even claim it. They were just given it to pass along at that time. Um, so that is 100% where I land with legacy is that I hope I can make an impact where the impact is seen, whether or not they remember Zach Shankin yeah. at all or the Vitruvian or any of it. 
I'm hoping that, yeah, that can, I can create something that is that inflection point or that dent, or maybe even just a little vertical, like this little corner of our reality, but made a meaningful impact for those people and their lifetimes and maybe lifetimes after. It's, uh, it's also not about the numbers, right? It's even though we both love to set big goals, it's about the human to human level. Mm. So if you can impact one person, you've done, you've done God's work, mm. you know, if you can impact a family member, if you can impact a friend, if you can help a friend in times of need, if you can give someone a smile on the street, you have no idea how that could affect their day, you know? So thinking of things more on an individual level while thinking big. I think is the key to legacy as well of staying in that present moment. Who can I help right here, right now? And how can I fill my own cup as well? Because if your cup is not full, you're not going to be able to give much to anyone. So, and then at the same time, thinking of the bigger impact. I completely agree. How do you, how has um, psychedelics influenced your perception of death? Because we're talking about legacy, the concept that there is a stop date for this, James. Yeah. Your your current body is finite. But is there a stop for the consciousness? Right. So um, has that changed for you because of psychedelics? Or where do you land on that? I think there is no death. There's just transition. Mm -hmm. the, the awareness that is you, not necessarily Zach, the avatar, the human avatar, but the awareness that is perceiving Zach, the human avatar is infinite. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if people truly meditate on that, they will feel the truth of that. And then psychedelics confirm that further. I think DMT significantly removed any fear of death because a, a very deep DMT trip is like dying. If yes. death was the most beautiful thing in the world. Because think about it, you're leaving your body yep. and you're in this other world, but you retain consciousness and then you lose fear of being out of the body. You realize when we die, probably that's exactly what happens. An extended DMT trip. Well, yeah. What's really fascinating is they've studied recently dead brains. Uh -huh. And they find that there's a massive spike of endogenous DMT. So it does really speak, uh, spark the curiosity that mm -hmm. maybe, just maybe, you're just starting the loop again. You're 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 tuning back in. You're respawning somewhere else in another vertical to go get a different experience to learn new lessons. Um, you, and and it is really freeing. Yeah, DMT felt to me like uh, the zeros and ones of reality. Like you're going to the raw raw source code. Mm. And I feel like when we die, probably we go to that place, mm. and then we formulate a new life plan. Maybe we reincarnate. Maybe we go to another realm. But that felt to me like this substrate of reality that's underneath this hologram, which feels so real and tangible, but isn't really. Did you find that... What would you describe that feeling like? You know, I felt so much love. Mm. My, my deepest DMT trip, the, the one that was the breakthrough moment... Just pure love, like tears were streaming down my face. That's why I said it's like dying, but if death was the most beautiful thing. Mm. I felt like I felt like I was home. I was like, I've been here before. Mm. In fact, even the very first DMT trip, which was not a full dose, was quite mild, was a more of a hybrid experience. I was still here, but things were kind of mold morphing and shaping and, and changing. That very first moment, I was like, oh, I've totally done this before. I had never done DMT before ever, but the first experience had a complete deja vu, wow. almost like, you know, how Vadim Zeland in Reality Transurfing describes all these timelines and parallel uh, timelines and mm -hmm. lifelines. It's like, oh, we've, we've been at exactly this moment multiple times in our character's story. Wow. This is the moment where I tried DMT and mm -hmm. it's happened before in multiple lifetimes. And it just felt so like, oh, this is not, this is home. I've been here before. Um, so to describe the feeling, yeah, love, pure love, pure source, God mm -hmm. comes to mind every time I do DMT. It's like, ah, oh, this is this is connecting me with something so deep. I I'm smiling because I'm glad that you use the word love because 
in the Bible, it has a verse like God is love. Yeah. But I think the is is, is, a, is a bi-directional bridge. Yes. God is love. Love yes. is God. Mm -hmm. And yeah, if I were to and will in the future when I record that podcast talking about breathwork, if I could describe the feeling being home mm -hmm. was was actually in my head words that I was used. Like you just feel like your home, that yeah. kind of warmth and just dissolving into love. Yeah. And that space is just so, so incredible. And I think we, we, pure consciousness, pure truth with a T, mm -hmm. God with a capital G, that it is just love energy, which we're getting real, real like oh, woo woo it. and mushy. But like, I, uh, mushy I, hope mushy. That, I hope that people have, you know, I, I hope that people have followed us here and, and are sitting in this space and, and can take it to wherever you are listening to this. I hope someone's tripping on shrooms as they're <laughs> listening to this. Yeah, I don't know what that would be like um, <laughs> or how complicated it would make the, the trip and experience. But wherever you are, whatever your psychedelic, non-psychedelic experiences have been, um, just take some time to sit with that concept and, and see where in life love, you have felt, felt the most love, felt the most safe, felt the most warm, felt the most home. Mm -hmm. That is kind of what I would describe as God. And then with the with what we talked about, like the truth is always somewhere nearby. If you're just, if you continue to look, just keep looking in life for what is the right or for me right technology or framework to view the world, the one that feels right, mm -hmm. the one that feels organic, feels like love. And again, with the fractal thing, it's like, how do you pick the right partner? You know. You yeah. feel that moment. You feel like totally safe with them. You can be totally self-expressive. You're not putting up any sort of front or wall or behavior pattern. Mm -hmm. How do you know you're in the right career field? How do you know any of it? How do you like know you're right mm -hmm. or somewhere close to that truth nearby? It's always got to be a feeling. It's never going to be a pro-con list or a P&L sheet or um, some sort of calculus your subconscious is doing the calculus. It's better at math than you could ever imagine. Mm. And it's taking in more data sets than the best AI in the world ever could. And if you just like remove the ego or like the need to grab on and figure it out, believe that you already know. Yeah. Do you feel like every molecule in the universe is made of love? Mm. And it is only our resistance to love that creates the suffering. Mm. Because that's the sense I get on psychedelics. It's like everything is love. Every every plant, every tree, every person, they're actually pure love. And it's just the layers and the resistance on top that we put that that make it look like anything that's not love. Sort of like the light and dark metaphor of like there is no such thing as darkness. There's light and then the shadow and, right, of that and the light. Of light. Um, um, I, I, would, I would say yes. I think it's hard to imagine like, I don't know, the word, the word molecule actually threw me just because I immediately was put in the science brain uh -huh, yes. and immediately was thinking like, oh, air molecules, water molecules, like how would they? But yeah, like... It, what they, would be a better word? Um, Every pixel of reality. <laughs> Maybe. I, I think that actually the words themselves, the semantic issue is part of the separation. And it's yeah. why I'm obsessed and like the meta skill I'm trying to master is communication. It's why I love to read. It's why I love to talk to people. And I love words and I'm trying to write and just communicate more and as often as possible because the more words I know, the more schools of thought, the more religions, the more all of it, if I'm armed with the entire breadth i can sit down with anybody and try to communicate truth with a capital t in what hits them mm -hmm. because for you it was that specific book right but for somebody else it's a different book or it's a person or it's a different moment or it's a podcast clip or it's this podcast or yeah. it's me or it's you for some reason everybody gets hit just slightly differently at whatever time when they're ready when the uh the years of understanding are, are ready uh the student has has prepared for the master so it's about creating as many opportunities. I'm, I imagine like my podcast is like every episode, every maybe minute of that podcast are tiny little touch points mm -hmm. for as many different people as possible to hopefully get a little nugget 
to be like that tinder or that inflection point, the catalyst for their journey. Um, but I think that, yeah, we are limited by the words that we know and even could possibly know because they will only get so close. They can mm. only get so like the word love. It's only so close. Mm. I think the Greeks were better because they had like four different types of love. So they can get mm. a little more granular. There was like, do you remember what they were? Oh gosh. Uh, philia. There, there was like a word for like love of God, love of a lover, lo brotherly love, and then something else. But it was great because they had a strata and it was like more specific because the difference between I love you, bro, and yeah. staring in the eyes of the woman of your dreams at yeah. your wedding day and saying, I love you, or mm -hmm. holding your brothers in arms, crying on each other's shoulders, saying, I love you. Like each one of those experiences is so different. Mm -hmm. But in English, we just say, I love you. There maybe is a beauty in that because maybe love is all of those things and we're, it's just a bigger umbrella, but I do like the specificity. So yeah, I think that the, the word molecule threw me and it is for the very reason that words are part of the separation. The Toltecs called it Maya, I believe, is the illusion. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, we're, we're kind of sp moving through this foggy space and words are part of, the, part of the problem. But if we can be intentional and work a little bit harder, we can get a little bit better at parsing through that, the Maya. That's the other thing DMT taught me was this is absolutely an illusion. Mm -hmm. You know how all the books say that, but to actually experience it, that that felt like home. That was the real, that was the real reality in a sense. Mm -hmm. This is a dream. Doesn't make, doesn't mean we shouldn't take it seriously. We're mm -hmm. here for a reason to learn, to grow, to evolve our soul. But at the end of the day, it's, it's a show. It's an illusion. It's a playground for our consciousness to you said do other people exist maybe not it's a playground for your consciousness to interact with other pieces of you mm. learn lessons but the real reality is is uh it felt to me like that was home after feeling that and mm -hmm. truly feeling that mm -hmm. did you find it calling to you quickly like i want to get back to that kind of feeling as much as possible like how do you mm -hmm. even yeah no because it gives you appreciation for this illusion as well Interesting. It's, it's really beautiful in that way it doesn't leave you craving that oh i need to go back to the dmt realm in fact a very intense dmt trip or especially an ayahuasca trip you're like i'm not gonna do this for at least a year <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah it's it's enough um because it's so intense as well so it gives you appreciation you come back you're like I have a body. It's tangible. I can feel things. Yeah. You know, there's a certain appreciation for that. Um, I did a shroom trip recently and I was in my room and I just realized, oh, this is not the right environment for this. I need to be outside. So I went to the beach and I'm sitting on the stone steps of Echo Beach and I'm looking over at the ocean and I feel like I'm seeing the ocean for the first time. Like, like really seeing it, the roar of the waves, the, the little particles of steam coming off the water. Um, it was nighttime and I could see the little ships in the distance. And it was so sharp. And I was like looking at these lights on the ships. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. This is like, and everyone is around me, like people on the left and the right. And they're socializing. And, and I'm just like locked in, tuned in. And I'm like, how is everyone not seeing the beauty? And of mm. course, I understand it's, you know, yeah, we... Yeah. We get caught up in the illusion. And we also, we put a linguistic frame on things. Mm -hmm. So Terence McKenna had this great quote of, um, this infant is lying in the crib and suddenly he sees this glittering uh, flying object and it's like reflections and, and he, he can see feathers and like all of these beautiful things. And then the mother comes and says, that's a bird. And in one moment, she has reduced this mystery mm -hmm. of this, all the vibrations and frequencies and senses and sounds into one word. And that's what happens to us as we grow up is we reduce everything. That's the ocean. That's a sunset. That's the stars. And on mushrooms, especially on the trip I did recently, as I was sitting there, I was not looking at the ocean in the linguistic sense of this is an ocean. Mm. I was looking at the raw source code of the ocean. Like this is the ocean. Like, Oh my God, I, I must sound crazy to anyone listening. No, no, but no. It's that pure actually seeing something, yeah. not seeing the mental construct that you put on top of it or the story around it, but actually seeing the ocean, seeing the stars. My God, stars, mm. like 
like everyone should be looking at the stars and just connecting with it and like the beauty in in a star to yeah, yeah i mean i could go forever <laughs> <laughs> no i like that a lot and um it reminds me a lot of the four agreements the terence McKen mckenna thing you were talking about because uh, he talks about yes from, in the first chapter right? right yeah he's just talking about you know it isn't it is up and until the point we start to get told that this is good this is bad for instance i, I have a um, one of the posts that's like on, on my on my instagram that i wrote a while ago is about the power of words and something i experiment intentionally with myself is it's a very simple example but it, i find it brings awareness to the issue when it's rainy it like if i were to describe a day to you and i would mm. say rainy mm. cold fog gray mm -hmm. it's like dirt on the roads mushy whatever yeah immediately you're like hmm that's a little less than ideal that's a bad weather day right but yeah. we say that that's bad weather because that's what we were told is bad weather like every person in parents and i don't want to just throw up shades at the parents like everyone around us it's like oh it's raining today shitty day like don't go outside day. you're don't gonna go get a cold yeah put yeah put a jacket where's on where's the kids they love the rain right? they play in the rain you run in the rain you splash in the puddles yeah so just refuse to call they play the in the mud good they, or bad yeah identify like it, it just is mm -hmm. some days are sunny some days are rainy they are days we experience them differently appreciate them for what they give you a rainy day may mean going and splashing in the puddles but you, maybe it doesn't mean that maybe it just means that oh today is amazing because now i can get a really awesome deep work session with my window open and listen to the sound of rain mm -hmm. while i'm on my laptop and then tomorrow it frees me up because i did all the work today so that i can go surf and hang out with my friends and be in the sun yeah so that's a simple example but the weather one i think is profound because like when when i made that description for myself or for anyone listening like you're immediately uh, like ah oh, it's a shitty weather day like bring awareness to that bring awareness to the fact that your mind is jumping to the, to describe it or characterize it or put it in a little box um and i loved also what you said about like seeing the ocean it makes me think about when you're truly being like empathetically present with a person versus when you're just waiting for your turn to talk like the difference in just really paying attention and it's hard it's very hard but just listening to their story only focused on them putting all of your energy into them when people give you that space it feels amazing and when you can give someone that space you know that they're they feel seen and heard um it's and i think presence, that, yeah yeah your presence what you said about rain reminded me of another mushroom trip where um i went into this trip to learn about abundance that was my intention mm. and in the middle of the trip it started pouring rain and the way like you said usually you could interpret that in a negative way but my mushroom intelligence at that moment was like ah the rain of abundance mm. so many drops of rain look at the abundance of water and then the every time it would have an insight the lightning would flash in exact synchronicity wow and every time i had like a, a difficult moment like where i had to forgive someone or forgive myself the thunder would roar mm. i was like the, the symbolism of the inside world and the outside world this is why i believe consciousness projects yep. reality it was unmistakable to me there was no separation um, but it reminds me of the rain the, the abundance of the rain the rain of abundance Mm -hmm. the lightning of inspiration the forgiveness of thunder you know it's like all of these you can use codes and words in a very beautiful way wow i really like that a lot um and yeah it, even all of this like I'm, I'm i'm starting to kind of take in the whole conversation as it's gone um can be for sure perceived by somebody as pretty out there pretty far far-fetched quote-unquote pretty woo-woo pretty whatever i'll admit to that <laughs> but my encouragement to the listening ear and at this point if they've made it this far they're probably already about that action but i would encourage people to just even if you don't believe yet or have had those felt experiences of the magical of the profound of the infinite it is a very useful if not just a more enjoyable frame to go through life thinking that there might be something going on thinking that there's a little spark of magic thinking that when i see certain numbers on a clock it's just a wink mm. or you know you get a certain parking spot or a room number or uh 
everybody seems to turn and look at you when you're going around and you're the main character like adopting these kind of frames even if it's non-magical at its inception just makes your life more enjoyable to go through as opposed to thinking that we are in strictly in a physical box confined by our bodies mm -hmm. live breathe eat shit die and then and that's it like it's far that's, less romantic it's a lie that's been sold to us far easier to convince people to work for 60 years for a paycheck mm. if they think it's all just physical and survival is the only thing that they need to do um if they knew they were infinite they were god they were pure energy and love they're less easy to convince to go against their gut to go against their intuition to abandon their dreams you know so I think that's where psychedelics can come in and and rather than hearing it from an authority you hear it from yourself mm -hmm. you tap into your intuition breath work is another amazing tool um you tap into your heart and suddenly you're less you're less likely to follow authority interesting well this has been an excellent conversation and i think we could go on ad infinitum but i want to circle towards the closer questions they will be somewhat related to this conversation certainly some more than others but i'm curious the first of the three is if you could go back to a younger version of yourself and tell him one thing what would that be <laughs> move to bali <laughs> move to bali first one that comes to mind expand on that um i think it's so important to get out of your comfort zone mm. get out of the country you were in uh living most of your life in get out of that box um another thing that comes to mind is don't wait mm -hmm. like whatever you want to do begin now there's just sometimes we think oh we're too young for this or too old or not ready or over ready i don't know like we we put all these limitations and it's like don't wait whatever you want to do just start lean into it even if you're scared shitless okay Find a five-minute task that will get you a tiny bit closer to that. You know, people spend their whole lives waiting, waiting, waiting. Yeah, yeah. You can you can spend a whole lifetime getting ready. Mm -hmm. I love that a lot. Yeah, like when you did your first podcast, were you ready? No, I mean, I, I love that that is now fixed in time for people to eventually go back through the rabbit hole because it was the most MVP of all MVP <laughs> products. Like it was I put my AirPods in my head, went to a quiet room that w turns out to be relatively echoey in the audio uh, at my university building and just clicked record on my app, didn't edit it, just clicked upload at raw. Like Beautiful. I haven't, I haven't personally revisited it, but it's there forever. And it's a perfect example of you don't have to have all the pieces. You never will be exactly where you need to go. I mean, I, this is going to be episode 51 of my podcast mm. and it's the first time i'm in a podcast studio yeah. so it's it's just proof of the pudding that like whatever vertical in podcasting is my this example works explaining but like don't spend time trying to get ready there's never a time there's never going to be a right whatever mm -hmm. the right time is now because it's the only time you have control over mm -hmm. like momentum mori, like you tomorrow's not guaranteed past is gone yeah so just act take fast action and and be shocked and surprised at how amazing the results are um yes. yeah and don't try to get it perfect on day one because even if you were to prepare for 10 years for your first episode guess what by episode two different set of circumstances different guest different dance partner you know i like to think of guests like you're dancing yeah. with someone so you're never you're always going to be put in new challenging situations so to anyone thinking of starting anything business a youtube channel a podcast just go after it. Couldn't agree more. Secondly, as we've discussed a number of them on this podcast, and as you know about me, big quote person. So what is one quote that's always stuck with you or that you try to live by? Change your thinking and keep it changed mm. by Emmett Fox. So people can change their thinking, but to keep it changed is the real challenge. Anyone can change their thinking for a day and feel more gratitude, feel more abundance, tap into the love. Uh, tap into the lessons you learned from breathwork. Mm -hmm. But to keep those insights, to keep your thinking changed, that's the real, the real deal. I love that. And then finally, 
What do you believe is your unique gift to give the world? <sighs> to accelerate the use of plant medicine and psychedelics worldwide. Amazing, brother. Well, this has been excellent. I want to thank those that made it this far in the podcast. It's much appreciated. Every one of you matters so much to myself, and I'm glad that you're here for this journey and that you shared this space with myself and James. Uh, James, let the people know where they can find you and what you're working on. They can find me at jameszander.com or on YouTube, James Zander, um, and also the mission, onebillionhumans.com. If you're into plant medicine or if you're even curious, go to onebillionhumans.com. I have a bunch of resources on how to trip, how to do it safely, how to do it intentionally, and uh, lots of love to anyone listening. This was a beautiful conversation.